Good morning, everybody. This is a day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it because this is his day. It's full of anointing, full of power. You've come expecting a miracle. Can I see a hand? Can I hear an amen? I believe that God has got something special for you today, designed especially for you in this service today. Father God, we thank you because you are the God of all gods. We thank you, Lord, because we can bow our heads and humbly come before you. Lord, we know no other way to come other than come to ask you for your blessings this morning and to thank you, Lord. Lord, to come to this service this day to confess our sins, to confess our wrongs, to come this day, Lord, to read your law, Lord, to come to make a provision, to come to say, Lord, we're going to do what is right in your sight. And Lord, as we are gathered together, we know that there are many needs in the house today. And Lord, we pray that as we give them, give you our needs, Lord, that you will answer those things according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Lord, we pray your blessings upon the Bissett family today. Lord, we pray for, for Shannon. We pray for Wayne and for Tommy Jr. Lord, we pray that you will, you will be near them as never before. Lord, we pray that you will be near another family, the Brennan family, Lord, who's lost uh, a loved one, who, whose son, Lord, is here right now in the parking lot. Lord, we pray your blessings upon that family. And Lord, we pray that you would give peace in the midst of the storm. And Lord, we know of the others who have, uh, who have contracted the, the virus. And Lord, we pray that you will make it uh, easy for them to get over it, Lord, we pray. And Lord, we pray for every one of the people here in this congregation, that you will put a shield around us, that you will put a mask around us, that you will put a, a tube around us, Lord, a wall of protection by the angel of the Lord. And God, we pray that you will do something special to keep that thing off of these people, we pray. As we do your will and as we do our parts, Lord, we pray that you will perform this thing today. And Lord, let every word and let every song, let everything, Lord, that is done today, Lord, let it bring glory unto you. In the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit, we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. Now, I want to just tell you that today is a, a very special day because it's a day that we're going to experience what it's like to have a revival. When I preach in, in just a few minutes, you're going to be going to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 9, and I'm going to show you four things. The Spirit is going to show you four things that you'll know from that book when revival comes. It's going to come to you, and you'll recognize what has already started in your life. Now, you've got the announcements, and you know about Mr. Bissett dying. You know that. But he went home on amazing grace. I wanted to tell you this, that when the nurse was by him, she prayed a prayer for him and sang Amazing Grace and noticed that down his right cheek there fell a tear. And they said, Tommy went home on Amazing Grace. Come on, let's clap our hands and praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory. Hallelujah. Now, we welcome you here today. I welcome my longtime friends. Daryl and Bonnie Clowers. They are two of the choice ones in this International Pentecostal Holiness Church. They're in world missions, and they have done a work that will stand forever and last generations to come. And here they are right here. Can I see a hand right there? Daryl and Bonnie Clowers. Make them welcome. Welcome to you, the Clowers family. We've traveled a lot of roads together, haven't we? Glad to have you here. And others who are visiting here today, we want you to fill out a card so we can send you a letter and thank you for being in the place today and with us here in the service. And now I'd like for you to make welcome Mr. John Campbell, one of our board members and trustees who is coming at this time. Would you give a hand and then let's be seated, please. Thank you, Pastor. And today is, today is, my goodness, I, I know I didn't do too good a job last week, but I, I didn't think you would have forgotten that quickly. Today is Pastor Appreciation Day, 
And well, we want to take a few minutes to tell our pastor how much we love him and Faye and the family. And the family's not here with us, but they're with us in the drive-in church on the hill. And we welcome them today. Each year we take time out to uh, recognize our pastor for his dynamic ministry for over 52 years here at Northwood. Through his leadership, the church is organized and has uh, order in our praise and worship, a place where needs are met and God is blessed with his children's praise unto him, a place where over a hundred outreach ministries have been formed to bless and help the needy, not only here in Fayetteville, but other countries around the world. And we have two missionaries to uh, tell us that, because we've been to visit them in uh, their country. And I forgot the name of it. Dominican Republic, I knew it would come to me, yes. We look around us at these beautiful buildings that uh, have been built to the glory of God, and we look inside of these buildings, and we see what but the lives that have been changed through the teaching and the preaching of God's word. And we give God the praise, and we praise him for raising up our pastor to lead and to teach us to be followers of Christ. During the past year, Pastor, you have been our help and guide through the COVID-19 pandemic. You have encouraged us to keep the faith and never give up. You have even preached it from the rooftop, literally. Right? Literally. Mm -hmm. Our prayer today is that God will continually bless you and your family with happy hearts and heavenly graces. At this time, I've asked Brother Effler, if he would, to come and pray over the family.
Please stand while they uh, return to their seats. I would like to make the special announcement now. Uh, each year, we try to figure out something that we can do different or give the pastor something different, and uh, ties are out and socks are out. So we finally come up with the old tradition that it's uh, good as gold, and that's we re like to receive a special offering for our pastor and appreciation for the great job that he has done for God and for God's children here. And at this time, as the ushers come forward, God bless you as you give. Now, if you write a check, write in the memo section that it's for pastor appreciation. We will be taking another offering in a few minutes for tithes and offering. But this is just for the pastor, so write it. In the memo section, Pastor Appreciation, and uh, we'll get it to the right guy. God bless you. Thank you very much. I know that this is a terrible time that we, we are experiencing with the pandemic. I realize that. And we have had a number of our people who couldn't be here, who can't be here. Like Steve Hale, Steve uh, Grant, and his wife Carolyn, and uh, uh, Sandy and uh, uh, Sandy and uh, Matt, Sh Matt uh, Shipley, different ones, all all over. It's hard to tell you. I mean, uh, a lot of them. Some of our staff have had it and have it now. Beverly is fighting with the positive, even of the weekend. Um, Sharon has, uh, has it also and is waiting for her negative report so she can come back to work. She's with the newsletters and uh, graphics. But as it is in this church, you have so many who are talented and can take over for the other. And it is amazing what they do. And if any of you want to uh, volunteer, we would love to have you to volunteer. We'll find a work for you to do, I promise you. If you'll give us an hour or two a day, sometimes we will do it. We, we um, are here today, and I'm here for the 52nd year, and I find it a great honor to be among this people. We came for two years. Honest, we came for two years. It was a tough time to come to this church uh, 52 years ago. We can say it's always been sweet. It hasn't always been this way. It's been good, but we it's had its moments. But I'm telling you, after a couple of years, it just started flying high, and God started moving, and God gave us great staff. Some of those staff are still here like Buck Hodge, people like this. And then we had him and Miss Thurman and different ones who, who came. And it, it really made a difference in the, the ministry. And it became a, a ministry of reaching out to other people. And we are so thankful that we had an outreach that said we want to reach the people regardless. We were the first church, as far as I know, in Fayetteville who disregarded color and race and told the people you can come to our church this is your church now and it opened itself up to many um, people from the uh, from the African American and from the islands and they found home here in this church wonder why they found home because you have a heart of openness and we want to say thank God for that today amen And you see the 50-some flags here, that's the, the people where we are represented all around the world. And we have a number, uh, on a good day, we'd have five or 600 of the Spanish folks, and then the school and all these things. And we're just so thankful to God for giving 
these things to us. And it takes management, and you've got the right people doing it. You've got the right person in the school over there with Renee McClam, second to none in administration. And the school is going forth, and it must keep going. We must keep our school. And everybody said amen. And, and all of the ministry that reaches out yesterday, uh, Buck was up here, and different ones helping him cook food for the shut-ins and for the people who can't come to church at all. We are trying to reach out, and our staff is reaching out to you during this pandemic to call and say, look, we just call to say we love you, and we want to know what we can do to help you. And folks really appreciate that, and we really mean it, and we'll go to the other side of the earth to do it. It would be virtually impossible to do the job. I use the word virtual here. Um, to do this uh, ministry without your cooperation and with the great staff that I have. And we will show our appreciation to this staff at Christmas. I want you to know that. It's not going without appreciation. And you know what I mean. And we, we, we do great things for them. And uh, I just want to thank God for them and because they keep on coming and because when they come, they stay. And... Uh, Praise the Lord for you as you come great distances like you do for the World Missions Ministry, for everything that's going, and just thank you for being a part. I want to thank you last for uh, letting me have a family here. Some predicted that I wouldn't have a family when I came here. I cannot tell you the rest of the story. But we did, decided that we would have a family, and we had a family. We had, we had Jennifer to add to it, and the reason they did not come in today it's not because, it is because of you, okay? It is definitely because of you, coach. They didn't come in and they elected not to come in, even though they want to see you. Boy, they said, Todd said, Dad, can't we, can't we, do, you don't need us? Jennifer said, look, we're going there for these people right now. And we're going there for Dad and Mama. And we're gonna be in the parking lot. We'll have each one of us in a car our family, your family, and their family. Women know how to pop the whip, don't they? And today they are on the parking lot up there, ready. We will not have a dinner afterwards as we normally do because we know that they have a tendency, and this is why they said they didn't want to come in. They said, we work at places that have it uh, abundantly. That's on, can be on us, and we may not have be able, we may not have it, but we could come in and we could give it to someone else and we cannot afford to do that, Dad. You can do it without us. And that's the reason they didn't come in. I promise you, they love your church. They love this church. It's always theirs. They're bragging on it and pulling for it. And we say salute them today. And for our people, not just our family, but for the people who are around the world today, like, like, Pam Arnold's, Arnold and Shepherd's daughter down in Largo, Florida. Uh, and Terry Allen over in California. And the Zimmets up in, up in Pittsburgh. Different places where they all scattered out. They are hearing this and watching it. And they write us and tell us what they see. We want to say welcome to you. And we are glad that we're your pastor. And we are going to do this. God willing, we're going to have long-range church, distance church, and we're going to teach the discipleship to you as you come together with us so that we don't ever lose each other. That's coming soon. We're working on it. And maybe then, Donnie, Janet, they can have what we're having now when we do it on Wednesday night. I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you for being around the world. Thank you for being a part of this church. Thank you for being in the parking lot. And we have that parking lot for those who are sick and who are elderly and who, who um, have diabetes and uh, high blood pressure and things that will aid in speeding up a death if they catch this. Now, I want to say to you, thank you for wearing your mask. Thank you. When you get with anybody else, you wear the mask. In this place, you probably are going to be less susceptible to it because of the high ceiling but one particle that is sneezed from someone else, a cough, and I know you read the stuff too, one particle is 
zero one of a milliliter or something like that. Anyway, to, to make it in my terms so that I can understand it, it's about one half the size of one of the human hairs diagonally or, or with its diameter. And so we, we, uh, we do everything we can with masks to protect each other. Now, some of you would say, well, you know, I don't, I'm okay. You're okay. We understand that. But you're young. You're 20-some years old. But I'm 60-some years old. And I want you to, what are you laughing at there? I am that many and more, okay? But I don't want to catch it. And, and we have proof with many others who have passed away. And we want to do everything we can to protect everybody else. And please, regard your brother and do everything you can to keep it off of you. I want to hug you so bad, I can tell you. I really do. That's why I introduced to you a hedge hug, where you put your arms around you and squeeze and say, he's squeezing me right now. That's called a hedge hug. Now look, look. I want to give you one more thing that you've warded off a little bit with. The latest facts say at NC State University in their labs, say they believe that cacao, they believe that uh, the um, green tea, and they believe that muscadine grapes, and one more is dark chocolate is going to help you to keep you from having it. <laughs> but they say that, that there's opening up studies for it, but watch everybody do a mad rush on a dark chocolate today. Amen. <laughs> now, today, at the end of the service, I want to give you an opportunity to give your regular offerings because they are scurrying from one area to the other. And I want to, I want to speak to you in a very easy, quick way today on four things, super real things, that will let you know if the revival is breaking. And you won't have to call anybody and ask them. It's from Nehemiah chapter 9. And I'm going to read all of this, but I'm going to bring it out in a moment. And some of the things that I say, understand, I am non-political, I am non-sectarian, in all of it, if I say anything, it's going to be only what God wants me to say. And I'm going to let him guard my words. This is the way I want to begin. After they rebuilt the wall, it says that the, on the 24th day of the month, they assembled themselves together, all of Israel, and put and, and did fasting no food, no drinks, no ice cream, no nothing. And they had sackcloth on, and they had earth, dirt on their head and bodies, dust. And they did that to show their humility. It says they separated themselves from strangers. I'm not sure if that's our, the way we're doing today or not, but... They separated themselves and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood in their place and read in the book of the law, that's Deuteronomy and Leviticus. And they did this for one-fourth part of the day, the, the bright day, the three hours, and then three hours again after they read the book, they confessed our sins and worshiped the Lord their God. Now that's, if you want to be biblical, this is what the Bible says. You can be seated, I thank you. There are two things that I'm going to start with that will let you know when the revival comes. Number one, it will be a proclamation of the word of God. It will not be what somebody else thought it will not be somebody else's idea. It will be strictly from the word of God that I read to you today. That's the first thing. The second thing, and that is that among the people, when they want it other than just a little thing that says, let me read this one thing a day, it will be getting into the word of God. There will be a hunger for it. Number two will be the mobilization of believers, moving the believers out to do what God has called them to do. 
Revival, first of all, does not relate to the unsaved. We say if we get revival, souls will be saved. That's true. They do. But that is not revival. That's evangelism. You can have evangelism without revival. Revival speaks directly to the children of God, to the family of God. 400 years ago, looking back on our history, in Germany, God lit the fires of John Calvin. You may not agree with his, his dogma. It's all right. But he lit his fire. Zwingli and Martin Luther with the thesis on the door saying we're going to be Protestants and we're going to have that along with the Catholic Church. Then later in England there came uh, John Wycliffe. You can call him Wycliffe, call him anything you want. You know, He's dead. He can't say anything about it. Then John Knox and John Hess came along and John Knox preached one day about Mary, Queen of Scots. She was an evil woman. And you're not supposed to say anything about anybody like that. John Knox stood in his pulpit and said, that old Jezebel is sitting on the throne down there. May God topple that throne. Well, Mary, Queen of Scots, made the statement about the armies of England coming to invade Scotland. She said, there's one thing I fear more than all of the ships and the battalions and the soldiers and armies of England. And that is the prayers of John Knox. Now that is real genuine respect for a man of God. And then along came others to bring the revival about that the Holy Spirit used. John Wesley preached thousands of times, rode thousands of miles on a razorback horse. No PA system, nothing like that. John Wesley had a brother named Charles. I know from what I read that Charles wrote at least 8,000, six to 8,000 hymns. You'd say, well, we don't know that. I know you don't. Well, let me give you a sampling of some without singing them. Number one is, oh, 4,000 tongues. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing of thy Redeemer's grace. Another one is, hark the herald angels sing. Charles Wesley, the brother of John, brought that kind of music. And he wrote the one called Jesus, lover of my soul, among thousands of others. And Wesley preached, and revival came all over England and the U.S. I base my few remarks upon the reading of this 11th chapter of Nehemiah. After they finished the wall, which shows you that good work really makes a difference, they all work together, a trial that does mortar and concrete and mud in one hand and a sword in the other. After they got through with the wall in 50-some days, an impossible thing, instead of going off on a vacation, they said, we're going to do what we're supposed to do now. We're going to reverence the Lord again. And we're going to thank him. And they got together, and this is what the 11th chapter is about. Many times we skip over the 11th chapter because we think that it is just dead stuff. It is dead stuff, and that is they were dead to themselves. And they recognized where the ability came for them to, uh, to, to build that wall that would protect Jerusalem, where some would come to live in Jerusalem and others would have to live in other places because it wasn't room for everybody to come and live. But my remarks this morning are going to be based upon those things. I have studied to the best of my ability and, and read everything I can every waking hour that I have. And I have tried to determine 
these four things, can't, there are many things that you'll notice, but the four basic common denominators that I have found in all of the things that I've listened to and all the things that I have read and studied today in the last 300 years, the things that have happened in 300 years, of course, not that I could be there. I've studied these things, and I found the four, and I want to call them super things that we are really aware of when revival comes. You will know it. It is unmistakable when the revival comes. Number one, now I'm not going to give this in a preachy message, but I want you to listen. I'm going to make it so that you can hear it and you can remember it. And if you'll get your Bible, I'm going to give you the scripture so that you'll know that I'm not just telling you something that I want you to have. I found this in the revivals that we had. It's going coming from that 11th chapter, and it's going to help to shape your life and your prayer life again, if you will allow it. The first thing shows up in the first verse and the second verses, these two verses. When a real revival hits the land, you'll know it. You won't have to have somebody to call you from the prayer tower or announce it on their prophetic uh, uh, scheme of, of doing things. You will know it as layman. You will know it because it will show what is happening to the people who have broken their hearts. Whenever you come to a group of people that are high-minded, conceited, and sold on themselves, you will know that there is no revival there. One of the humblest men that I've ever read about was D.L. Moody, the shoe salesman. As a matter of fact, the Lord laid it on my heart, and I read it early this morning. There is an excellent reading that you ought to read on D.L. Moody by R.A. Torrey from the Moody Bible Institute after Moody died. And he said uh, that faith will bring people in, but humility will keep the people. Humility will keep, keep somebody working and doing it for the Lord Jesus Christ. The humility that we have is a broken heart. What they did immediately was to fast. And when they fasted, they put on sackcloth, took off their clothes like this right here, or whatever they had was sporty, and they put on sackcloth, old bags, burlap bags, and wrapped them around them. And to add to their sorrow and to their symbol, they took dirt by the handfuls and dust and put it on their head and on their shoulders and let it run down their body to remind them that they were nothing but the dust themselves made of dirt and that one day we would return to that dirt that, would, that we came from. When the law was read, and that was a big portion of their revival that was about to break, the revival on the house of God, and the house of God was Israel. When the revival began to break, the first thing that broke was the word of God. You'd say, oh, but we don't have time for that. We're going to have a, a hoot nanny. We're going to have a shindig. We're going to have a, a whatever else it is. We're going to do something. And they did it, and they read the Bible. You'd say, what on earth did they do that for? They read Deuteronomy that they had and Leviticus, the law. Well, they could just read it just like you did, read two or three scriptures because, you know, we don't have much time today. They read the Bible for one-fourth of the day. Read it in the 11th chapter. One-fourth of the day they read the Word of God. They didn't have the New Testament as we have. They read the Word of God. When they got through reading the Word of God and all of them listening, all of them standing, by the way, while the main reader, readers would sit, that was their custom. After that, they said, we now have to respond to it. And they responded with their prayers 
And they prayed unto the Lord for another three hours, straight through. Now, I want to ask you, how long has it been since you prayed for three hours straight? Well, I don't, I don't have time to pray for three hours straight. We live in a fast world, don't we? I realize that. I realize just how fast the world is and how it's moving. But one day we will remember and, and think, Lord, the greatest thing that we could have ever done would have been to pray. These were days of humiliation for them, days when they would humiliate themselves and joy would come back into the, into the city and into the house of, of the Lord. These people, according to the scripture, would set aside that time and they wouldn't move until they had done what they felt was right. Now, I don't know why they did it for one-fourth of an hour or one-fourth of a day. I don't know who said that you had to do a certain thing like that. I know this, that when the Holy Spirit is here and when he's in your life working, you will realize that you're going to do some things that God directs you to do. Dwight Moody said, Bill Moody said, you know, he said, I love the Lord so much that even if God told me to jump off that building, I'd jump off. He was 280 pounds. Tory said he never saw a man who was more de dedicated to God than he. He preached to 100 million people without microphones or without anything over the years. And he preached it. I wish you could just read some of that. It is something to read it. But it is the humiliating of ourselves to say, Lord, I don't amount to as much as I thought I amounted to. Lord, I pray that you will help me to get myself straight and let me not think too highly of myself. The second thing, there are only four. The second thing that we will know when the revival breaks there will be a consideration of God's goodness. Now, I took this from this uh, 11th chapter and worded it like this, a consideration of the goodness of God. Some of us complain, and I'll be the first to say, Lord, why do I hurt? Lord, why do I have to go to the doctor? And when I get there through that, why do you have to go to another doctor and all these things? And we say, Lord, why don't we have this and why don't we have that? It's in us to do that. That is a natural man. But these folks just began to praise the Lord in prayer and confession for the goodness of God. Where I found it was in the 16th through the 19th verses of chapter 11, where it says, but they and their fathers dealt proudly. This is the leaders that were before them. Nothing was happening then, and this is why they rebuilt the walls. They were torn down. Nothing was going right for the children of Israel. It was coming on, though, because God spoke through the Spirit to Nehemiah and to the king. And so he said, the fathers dealt proudly, but you are God, and you are ready to pardon. Yes, when they had made a molten calf, it says, and called him their worldly leader, they said, he will do it, this molten calf will. And Moses is up in the mountain. Do you remember? They were going back to bondage, and it says it here. They would return to bondage, and yet you in your manifold mercies forsook them not in the wilderness. This is from the 16th verse of chapter Nine, if you'll look, chapter nine, the sixteenth, the sixteenth verse, and then, and then, and and I did, I, I did confuse it. I'm sorry. I meant the ninth chapter, not the eleventh chapter. If you'll please forgive me. Sometimes I'm I'm like that. Not not all the time. Um, God can handle any kind of rebellion that you and I make, that you and I do. He can handle it. It will not be hard for him. But I wanted to tell you that in the 50-some years that I've been working with you and preaching with you and helping with you, you know, ministering, that I have never seen anybody yet who came to the Lord humbly and asked him to forgive them, that 
he did not forgive them all. Now, I've had some people to come from distances when I would speak on the unpardonable sin, doctors and all. I mean, I mean this. And they would say, I want to know what the unpardonable sin is. Why don't you stop worrying about the unpardonable sin? And let me give you my definition of the unpardonable sin. The un to me, I, I know what I preached it and all these things, but I want to get right down where we live right here. The unpardonable sin is the sin that you commit and will not confess to the Lord. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you believe that? Then it is in the confession that God brings to you the answer for your need. He will never turn his back on you. There is nothing that you could ever do. There's nothing you could ever say, no place you could ever do, no place you could ever go, nothing that you could ever do wrong. Regardless of how heinous this thing may be, that would ever make God dislike you. I grew up in a church that in a time when they believed that, you know, if you did something like that, God always had a hit list on you. And, and I ran from God a long time like that. I said, he's about to get me. Then I realized one day that God wasn't like that. And still in my older days when I became a pastor, and even since I was here, I had this kind of feeling. Are there some things that the Lord is not going to forgive me of? Are there some things that are rougher than others? I would hear of things that others had done. I'd heard of and seen things and counseled them myself right here in the church. And I would say, Lord, how can you still use God? You know, how can you keep using that person? And the Lord says, you know, I have a whole lot more forgiveness than you do. I believe that the Lord understands us a whole lot more than humans understand. Can I get an amen from anybody? Some people may not forgive, but I'm telling you, the Lord forgives and he forgets. And so that unpardonable sin is a sin that you commit that you will not go to him and say, Lord, I ask you to forgive me of that sin. The Lord knows where you are in your life. And the Lord, regardless of how bad you are, regardless of what you do, the Lord has come for you to tell you, you do not need to be lost. You don't need to go to hell. You're going to be saved because I am pulling for you and I'm, I'm in your corner, in other words. I'm going to save you and bring you in. I think one of the greatest realizations came in a song. We, we, we don't sing it, but you remember it. I'm sure you do. You all do. Some of you do if you're old enough. But I used to listen. I, I liked Falwell. Falwell was instrumental in my ministry and with Gardner Gentry and, and some of the great preachers, greatest preachers I ever heard. They were at the big bus conferences at Lynchburg Church. Uh, Falwell had a man, you remember he had a program on television, didn't he? It was called the Old Time Gospel Hour. You recall that? How many of you saw it? You remember that just before Falwell ever preached, let's, let's do your trivia, he always had somebody to come out and sing. It wasn't the choir. The choir had already done that thing. The congregation had. Does anybody recall who it was? His first name was Doug. You remember it was Doug Oldham. Doug was a big puppy, but Doug would say, Oh, we've come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord, trusting in his holy word. He's never failed me yet. I realized through the singing of old Doug Oldham, who's going to be with God now, that sang for Falwell before he preached, that he was saying to us, God was saying to us, that you're going to have to do something really bad that's going to make me not forgive you, and I've never found anything that God could not forgive. God really loves you. And in revival, when you get to that point, 
You're going to be like they did. They remembered the goodness of God. That's two of them. And now, so we'll catch them all. Number, number three is going to be a realization of sin. Oh, now, John, you, you can't talk about sin. Because we don't even use the word S-I-N anymore. It's blunder. It's mistake. It's uh, peccadillo. It's all these little things. It's just as wrong in the book now as it was then. It's a sin. And sin can never enter there. Revival will sweep you into it. And you'll find that you'll go to him more. And ask him to cleanse you of any kind of sin. Now, may I just kindly say to you, and I mean it kindly, I don't know how, I don't know how we have so much lying going on in this country. Folks, I want to tell you this. This is a lying, there is a lying spirit. Now, you just say it's a homosexual spirit or a sexual, we always know how to jump for that. There is a lying demon in this country that would sooner tell a lie and swear to it. It's been going on lately. You remember when Watergate came out? Watergate came out in the 70s. They nailed Magruder and uh, Chuck Colson and those guys and, and the president, Nixon. He wasn't above the law. And it wasn't nearly as bad as we've got things going on right now. And we can lie through our false teeth about anything we want to. And nobody will tackle it. And we can brush over it and say it's okay. Now understand I'm non-political. I don't care what your political persuasion is. But I heard a true man of God. He's not a member of our church or anything, but his name is William. Bill Bennett. Remember him? He has a wonderful book that I have in my study called The Virtues, The Book of Virtues. It is so terrific. I heard him this week make this statement. He said, I want you to know, he said, I used to be on the far left with my liberal ideas, no God, kill this, lie that, and everything. He says, I know exactly how they think, and they think that they had been raised up by God to make us right our wrongs on this side where we are conservative. And we believe in God and we believe in the word of God and prayer. He says, but I was of that persuasion, but something happened to me. I heard him. Something happened to me, he said, and I had to change. And that's why he wrote the book of virtues. Look, when we get real saved, and revival hits us, we are going to stop lying and cheating, and we're not going to do anything like that. I think the reason that we did it then is because we were on the very tail end of a revival that had swept America in the 40s and 50s and 60s, and ending in the 70s with the Jesus people. We believed that things were wrong then. Now, we are going to be in real trouble, heat big pronto trouble, when God gives us over so that we can say, no, this is wrong, and this is wrong, but this is, we cannot do it ourselves. To quote my professor, John Swills, the late John Swills, you can have no revival, and you can have no godliness, and you can have no repentance unless you have genuine repenting of the sins and coming to God. And when he forgives, he forgets. Can I see your hand? Can I, can I hear you clap it out today? Amen. When that comes, I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you've done. You've got it with God at that time. We realize, Lord, as Billy Graham said it over and over again, Lord, I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. Now, number four, I do it very quickly. Number four we will come to obedience. We say, man, I'm fighting on the trail today, man. I'm fight, 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 fight for God. Forget about your fighting. 
and come to, re come to repentance and come to the word of God and come to obedience. Because when Samuel walked into that camp and smelled that barbecue cooking that afternoon, and Saul wouldn't send the man out unless he did a sacrifice. He said, I smell barbecue cooking. What's happening? He said, well, I did this because I couldn't send the man out without a sacrifice. He said, Saul, you're the king. You're, you're getting out of line. You've crossed the line. It is not your place to do this. And that man of God rebukes straight on that king right then, six foot six of him. And that little short guy looking up to him and saying, I'm rebuking you right now. And he said, have you not ever learned that obedience is better than sacrifice and the fat of the rams? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice to you if you were King Saul. Your sacrifice, you say, well, I've given my body, I've given my time, I've given my tithes, I've given my offerings and all this. Folks, nothing is as important as your obedience to Christ to where you Submit yourself to him. Forget about fighting the devil all the time and with your pugilistic hit. Come on. Peter said, don't fight first, but submit first. Submit yourselves to God, and then you can resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But you go out there saying, I rebuke you, I rebuke you, devil. It's not going to do any good unless you are submitted unto him, unless you come under the bloodstained banner with him. Obedience is the right place. It happened with these folks. And as we read through it from that, uh, from that uh, ninth chapter, from that ninth chapter in verse one, you come to the very end. And I think that I really want to read you this one right here again, right from the word of God. It's the last verse of chapter nine. This is what they did about getting them the business of submitting themselves. Let's see if we've done it. Now understand, I'm asking myself, not you. They stood there in the temple, at the temple, uh, at the wall, rather, a section of the wall, and they wrote, they said, and because of all this, we make a sure covenant. Have you made a sure covenant like the king did over there that stood in a certain place against the wall in 2 Kings. Have you made a sure covenant with him some things that you ought to make? I ask you. Oh, that's not all. I want you to see how God drives a hard bargain and how they drove it. And here are my last words to you today. Make your covenant. You say, it's my word, man, it's my word. Your word. Who's got any word today? You know good and well that you have to have affidavits and you can't do anything without a lawyer anymore. They made their covenant. Hear it. And I'm going to read it to you in verse 38 of chapter 9. And because of all this, we made sure of our covenant. We made make, to make a sure covenant and we wrote it down. I want you to say that with me out loud. Come on, write it down. What do you do, John, when you write it down? You seal it. And the princes and the Levites and the priests sealed it and put it down with their seal. And in that second Kings, when the, they did it, it said every one of them, the princes, stood for it. They stood up for it and vouched for it. Who's going to vouch for you? Who knows what you've done and what you promised and what you gave? Who knows what you're doing with your life today? Jesus knows. Have you written it down? Have you been willing? Well, I don't write things down. If I'm giving something to the church or anything else, write it down. When you write it down, it is the surest, I'm going to give it to you, what I've believed all my life, I hope we never lose cursive writing. It is the surest way to communicate of anything that you could find better than 
than these uh, uh, things that we write, these messages and text and all that, better than anything else, is when you write it down. And if you've got a seal, seal it. But write it down, and you write your name down. And you say, Lord, by God's grace, I'm going to do this. And that's when it happens. And when you see these things happen in your life, you know that you're beginning to come to a revival. And unless you do, you've got something else and not a revival from God. And everybody said, Amen. Can you receive the word as easy as I've given it to you through the time? Can you receive the word of God on your feet? Ushers? Ushers are coming, and um, this is for your offerings for the church. Give your offerings. We really need it in the church to make sure the ministry goes through the city and around the world. And while they're coming and just taking a stand and facing you there, and you get ready to give your offerings, um, we've never missed a payment, even in all the pandemic. We've never missed a mission payment. We've never missed a church payment, a school payment, or anything. That's because of you. And we praise God for you. Come down and give your offerings or ushers if you, however you do it, okay? Walk out among them and let everybody give for the glory of God.